Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, wonderful and exciting seminar with Verbatim Theatre, Looking Beyond Boundaries, Binaries, sorry. Uh, my name is Amina Yakin, and I am uh, chairing the event. I'm um, chair of the Decolonizing Working Group at SOAS, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. And um, <clears throat> tonight's event is um, really kicks off. It's a pre-event for our Festival of Ideas, which is taking place in the week of 19th to the 24th of October. It's SOAS's first Festival of Ideas. It's dedicated to the theme of decolonizing knowledge, and it um, builds and borrows from uh, the work of um, Akhil Mbembe and looks towards how we are thinking about from ideas of decolonizing the curriculum to a structural decolonization within institutions in, um, in our current climate. And it is, gives me great pleasure to introduce today's um, <clears throat> guest speakers and to, to welcome back um, a theater group who have been a very important part of this journey. They last year, Butcher Boulevard were invited for a residency at SOAS to examine individual and institutional responses to decolonization through a new piece of work. And uh, they presented this amazing verbatim show, Decolonization, Not Just a Buzzword, which captured campus conversations and compelling uh, interviews and narratives that were recorded by the creative team and the show will be will be performed at the Festival of Ideas with an online performance and Q&A on 24th of October from 5 to 7 p.m. It is free um, so please do register and we look forward to welcoming you to that as well. In today's session this is very much a pre-event <clears throat> and um, I'm I, it gives me uh, great pleasure and um, to welcome back Sudha Butcher and Nila Dolly Jalova from the core creative team to share their journey of using verbatim theatre to make work that democratizes theatre to amplify voices of underserved communities and to help us think about how is it that they bring these amazing storytelling methods into our spaces and share them with us. So um, I am not going to speak anymore. The format of the evening will be that um, the uh, Neela will, I will hand over to Neela who will introduce you to what the rest of the stuff is going to be about. They will uh, do their bit for an hour and then we'll have the panel discussion in the second hour. And I look forward to reconnecting with all of you then. So for now, um, I'll hand over to Neela. Neela, welcome and thank you for joining us and welcome to all the team who are here. Thank you, Amina, and thank you everyone for having us. We're really looking forward to this evening. Um, before I pass over to Sudha, we, we don't quite know what you're seeing on your screens at home, so we wanted to just see if we could get some Zoom settings that might help the webinar look even better for you from wherever you're watching. Um, if it's easy for you, if you could go into your video settings, which for most people are in there, if you see your stop video button, there's a little arrow next to the stop video button. If you click in there, you can go into video settings and there's a box to hide non-video participants. So if you can tick hide non-video participants, that will give you the best view of the seminar this evening because we'll have some performances by the actors that you can see on screen and it will look best. So if possible, go into your video settings and hide non-video participants. Um, otherwise, the easiest thing to do is just to make sure you're in speaker view rather than gallery view. That should give you a better experience as well. Um, lastly, in terms of the chat box, the chat box has been disabled for now because we're going to be sharing some links with you during the seminar. Um, but it will open again for the Q&A. So that's the way we can kind of start a conversation once we've gone through the, the main part of the seminar. Um, I hope that's clear enough. Um, but if you can't do anything else, just go into speak of you and hopefully it will be a good experience. And I'll now pass over to Sudha. Thanks. Just 
unmute myself. Thank you so much, Neela. Um, I just wanted to say a welcome from Butcher Boulevard, from myself and Suman Butcher, who's, who initiated this project in relationship with SOAS. We're delighted to be here for this seminar. Um, as Amina and Neela have said, this is going to be very much a sort of sharing, a very informal sharing of our creative practice and journey. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about um, the show that is going to be on, on campus. And we also have some wonderful actors with us. So there will be some very practical examples. We're going to be looking at headphone verbatim technique, as well as how verbatim can be used as a starting point for work in the way that sometimes I make my work. So um, we're going to just introduce you to the actors. We have Hasina Raja, uh, we have Anna Nugin, Rajivan Vasan, and Naveed Khan. So to set the scene, we have a taster from decolonization, not just a buzzword, live. And can we please invite Anna and Rajivan who will explain the technique and also share some voices from the show. So you're gonna hear the voices of some students and then two voices of teaching staff. So that would be um, the taster. Great. Thank you, Siddha. Um, so this is headphone verbatim. Um, it's a, a whole process in itself. Um, and basically it, it starts with sort of interviewing. There's a technique in sort of the interviewing um, stage as well, um, where you're trying to extract, uh, thinking about the kind of questions you want to ask and extracting the story from the people that you're interviewing. Um, and then it goes through to an editing process. And again, there's a, a sort of a skill around editing as well to try and really hear the story that the person is saying um, and then once these interviews are edited um, they're sort of put together by the director to form a cohesive uh, piece of theatre which are then played by a number of actors or just a solo actor um, and then we are hearing the interviews through these headphones in our ears and I'll just pass to Rajivan to tell you a little bit more about that. So as we put the headphones on we hear the voices coming through and it's our job to repeat them as authentically as we can without any kind of judgment or any kind of comment. So with that in mind, um, Anna, shall we go for our group piece? Okay. We're Let me know when you're ready. Start with the group piece or puppies. Oh. Neela. Um, these, these are just excerpts from buzzwords so start with the group piece okay that'd be brilliant second so um anna and rajivan are currently trying to coordinate pressing play at exactly the same time because they're obviously not in the same room um, and this is the slightly tricky part of what they're about to do um. Sorry, just having trouble with my Dropbox. Okay. okay. Ready? Yeah. Three, two, one, play. Well, we had our culture in Africa class or first class. It's okay for you to want to know more about African culture as a white person, but to say that the reason that you're taking African culture is because you want to help the poverty in Africa and not even be specific about what poverty you want to address. There's so many people like that in my class and I'm like, yo, like what's good? What are you doing here? It is not even that. They had this whole like monolithic idea how Africa is just mm. one. A lot of us here are just trying to find who we are. We're just trying to find our whole ancestry. We're trying to find how, where we come from, you know, what, what, what's the flag that we carry every time in our house? What does that mean? But for them, it's like, you know, let me just discover stuff. Let me just learn stuff. Uh, Neela, do you want us to go on to the next one? Yes, fantastic. So now I think um, Anna will share a voice, which is from one of the teaching staff at SOAS. And then after that, Rajivan will share another teaching voice at SOAS. Okay. 
Thank you. Artifacts and having to go back, the apology. And I'm not sure why I'm not sure about it. So I need to think it through. The question of reparation, I think, is an important one. I think the, the idea of apologizing or I don't know if you really need to apologize. I think it's more recognition of the past and that that past was one of hierarchy and domination as political power. So rather than venerate someone like Churchill, portray him for what he was. He might have been a great leader with regards to the war here, but actually he's um, a, an oppressive despot, despot elsewhere and provoked great misery in India and elsewhere in the empire. Thank you, Anna. And now Rajivan, when you're ready. Sometimes there's a question about who it will be returned to. So whenever the initial of the coin or, for example, is brought up, the diamond, this is passed through so many different hands, Persia, Iran, India, different kingdoms, that the idea of an original owner is, is very difficult to pin down. There are other cons where the artifact does have a clear provenance. It's from somewhere. It means something to a particular community. The Elegant Marbles is an interesting case. The British Museum, I think, has said that by displaying these objects and artifacts in the British Museum, it has effectively opened it up to the world to come and see. I don't buy that argument because to get inside Britain is not an opportunity that's open to everyone. Thank you, Anna and Rajivan. So, um, Anna and Rajivan were sharing extracts from the show that we put together last year at SOAS called Decolonization, Not Just a Buzzword. And I'm going to post the link to it in the chat now because it will be part of the Festival of Ideas um, on the 24th of October. So, if you want to sign up to see the whole show and hear lots more voices from SOAS performed in this headphone verbatim technique, that, that's the place to sign up. Um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about the history of verbatim theatre um, and for me verbatim theatre is can often be referred to as like a documentary form of theatre um, where you're using words from real life and putting them on stage. Um, as a young child I was probably first introduced to verbatim theatre going to the tricycle theatre which is now known as the Kiln Theatre in Kilburn. Um, the tricycle has had a long history of putting um, political theatre on stage and they had um, the Colour of Justice which was about the Stephen Lawrence's murder and the trial um, that followed and I remember going to the tricycle theatre and seeing this put on stage and this was like court proceedings on stage um, and they also had a verbatim play about Guantanamo and about the prison there which I also saw when I was quite young and I think those two pieces of theatre really stuck with me um, where what you were seeing on stage you knew that these were real words that people had spoken and said um, in real settings that had a real impact and effect on people's lives. Um, that type of verbatim theatre is where those words have been used to write a script and the actors are then learning those lines and performing them on stage from that script. Um, other, you know, the other shows that have been more recently made like London Road by Lecky Blythe, which have looked at the um, brutal murders of the sex workers in Ipswich. So this, has, this form has a long history of being used in political theater specifically. Um, the form that you've just seen Anna and Rajivan do with the headphones on is called headphone verbatim theater. And I'm going to try and explain briefly kind of how that happened. Um, it's a relatively new form. Um, from what I've learned about it, its origins are quite um, almost by, by accident, this form has come around. So um, the theatre maker Anna Devere Smith in America was putting together a verbatim show about the Crown Height riots in New York. And she was interviewing lots of different people about the riots, the impact on their lives, how they felt that those riots had been portrayed in the media. And she's an incredible performer, um, if you've ever had the pleasure to see her. And to learn these people's voices as closely as possible as she could after she'd interviewed them and edited these interviews, 
she um, was listening to her original interviews in her rehearsal. And in rehearsal, she was listening and speaking at the same time to try and pick up all the tone, intonation, patterns of speech um, that these people had. And she was planning on taking the headphones out for her actual performance. So for her, listening to the original material was just to get um, her kind of head around it um, and to be as accurate as possible. Um, another practitioner called Mark Wing Davies actually saw her rehearsing and said, you know, actually this, this technique of having the headphones in during performance is very interesting. Um, and so that's how people have started to work with that technique. He's, he's kind of um, worked with it himself and passed it on to others. And I would like to now pass back to Suda because um, Tamasha Theatre Company is one of the theatre companies who was very close in learning that technique and using it quite early on. So Suda, please, please take over from me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, very briefly, I mean, um, the other co-creative, Christine Landon-Smith, who can't be here, um, she and I are co-founders of Tamasha Theatre Company, and we were introduced to the headphone uh, technique um, through a practitioner called Louise Wallinger. Uh, and so, you know, we were very thrilled with that, and we made a show called The Trouble with Asian Men. Um, and at the time, it was when Asian men were in the news for you know, ostensibly being seen as trouble, you know, something that has carried on the trope of the Asian men. Um, so we, we actually wanted to look at what was troubling Asian men. So we did about 100 hours of interviews uh, with people, you know, the kind of stereotypes, are they mummies, boys, metrosexual men, looking at their masculinity, their relationships with Asian women, their mothers, are they tied to their apron strings? And actually that show was very much, you know, there to sort of overturn the trope of Asian men being trouble. Um, and so after that, I mean, you know, we, that was a, a Tamasha Theatre Company, but then Christine and Neela have teamed up quite a lot in recent years and they've done a lot of shows for, um, you know, headphone verbatim. So Neela will now take you on the journey of their work and her practice. Thank you, Sudha. Um, so a little bit of uh, history of how I've ended up working quite a bit with headphone verbatim as a form and why I enjoy working with it. Um, so I, five years ago, I was a math teacher in London and in my math teaching, I had also had some responsibilities in PH, PSAG education, so personal, social and health education, including in sex education and found that this topic was one of the most complex topics in schools um, in terms of how sex education and sex and relationship education was seen, was taught, was talked about. Um, I'd always also had some kind of love and work in theatre um, outside of my teaching and when I left teaching the first thing I wanted to do was to make a play about sex and relationship education and I wanted to make a play for adults not for young people because in my opinion, it was the adults who were struggling to have conversations about sex and relationship education. And it was their inability to talk, um, which was kind of hindering young people's learning and their ability to get the education that they needed. Um, I decided to make this play a verbatim play and I wanted to go and collect interviews to try and work out what was stopping adults talking openly and having conversations about these topics. Um, I saw that Tamasha were running a workshop on verbatim theatre but something called headphone verbatim run by Christine Landon Smith and I it was for actors it was actor training and they were going to learn the whole technique of how to interview how to edit and then how to have the headphones on and perform and I, I wrote in I said oh I'm I'm not an actor but I would love to come and observe the the workshop process to learn more um, from my own practice and in doing so and in being part of that workshop and watching Christine teach um, I fell in love with the idea of actually using headphone for my own project. Um, I found it particularly interesting to see actors have to deeply listen um, to the words that they were hearing and what impact that had on performance. Um, to me, it's the fact that deep listening is at the heart of every step of making headphone verbatim theatre that makes it particularly useful for a topic that might be um, complex or socially contentious. Um, you, as an interviewer, so for me going out and gathering interviews for my play, 
you have to deeply listen to people from a range of different opinions and it's their voice which is central in that interview it's not necessarily about my opinions although you could argue that it's impossible to remove your own opinion from an interview process but you as an interviewer your role is to deeply listen to that person and allow them to tell the story that they want to tell then when you go on to the editing side of that you obviously have taken your interview you've got written consent and legal consent from them they've signed a form to say that you can use that material otherwise that breaks a whole load of rules and laws um, so once you've got your you know consensual piece of recording and you go into the edit phase um, I learned to edit um, in that workshop with Christine and it was much easier than I thought and I was very pleased that I'd learned a new skill so in the edit, you also have to deeply listen because you're trying to find out what's the heart of this story, what's the heart of what this person is trying to say. And there are a few rules that you follow when you're editing for headphone verbatim. Well, I personally keep it chronological, so I don't take minute seven and put it before minute three. I try to ensure, well, I make sure, I hope, hopefully I do, I don't always get it right, that you stay true to what that person is saying and you try not to change anything that would change the context of what they were saying. You know that that person you've interviewed could be sitting in the audience when your play is on and you want to make sure that they feel accurately represented on stage. So you chronically, chronologically edit those pieces and to do so you have to deeply listen to work out what is it that person wants to say on stage. Then in the rehearsal process, the actor's job is to deeply listen. I know that Anna and Rajivan will be happy to talk about this in the Q&A, but it's a very strange feeling, I think, as an actor to put on headphones and you just have to channel the voice that you're hearing. You can't necessarily even hear yourself on what you're saying. It's not about you adding any layers on of your own emotions, how you think that person is feeling how you feel about what they're saying you are just trying to capture their voice and every breath and change of how they speak and in doing so hopefully you are sharing that person as honestly as possible and honoring their voice and their story the most important part of headphone for me is then the impact that it could have on the audience now how it looks on zoom is probably very different and i think during covid we're all learning and working out how these things land but in a physical space with each other, the actor's role would be to ensure that they maintain eye contact with the audience as much as possible during their performance. So whenever they're delivering, they're delivering two individuals in the room. They might look at different people throughout or they might just pick one person and share it with them. So for the audience's um, experience, it's almost as if they are in conversation themselves with the original person who was being interviewed and you are just there to deeply listen to that person. You do not have a, an ability to kind of reply to them or start a, a debate if you disagree with what they're saying. So you do just deeply listen. My reason for the kind of thinking that deep listening is so important is for me, theatre is political and should be political and it should be used to to talk about topics that aren't often talked about or that need to be talked about and at the moment the thing that i care about the most is that empathy is something that at the, in the world at the moment needs far more of and i've always thought that this practice of deep listening for me as a practitioner for the actors for the audience is something that builds empathy between between people um, a few weeks ago i listened to a hidden brain podcast which threw me a bit because they had some research papers that said that empathy, if people are very score very highly on empathy, which we often assume to be a brilliant thing, what we often forget is that actually that empathy only applies to the people that they perceive as being in their group. And so even if you score incredibly highly on an empathy test as someone who's very empathetic, empathetic this doesn't necessarily mean that you will treat everybody that way. And that's something I'm sure we all know is a, is a, is a problem. And the thing that made me kind of feel a bit more hopeful at the end of that podcast is how they talked about the fact that that idea of your group is something that people can expand. So how people define their group is actually something that you can um, change over time. And so I'm beginning to think and enjoy thinking about in headphone verbatim, how can this form be used to make people actually expand who they perceive to be their own group. And if you're building empathy at the same time, that to me feels like a, a good and exciting thing to be doing with, with theatre. So I'm, yeah, whether you argue headphone verbatim can build empathy, I believe it can if it's done in the right ways. And that's what makes me um, really interested to keep working in it. 
Having said that, there are a lot of risks with this form of theatre, um, lots of ethics to consider. So in the interview process itself, obviously, you need to have consent from the person that you are recording the interview with because you need an audio recording. If you're dealing with sensitive topics, you have to make sure that you understand the impact that you have as an interviewer on someone you're talking to, what your positionality is as an interviewer, how that impacts their ability to speak. There's a whole, for me, a question of how extractive is this model as a piece of theatre? Are you taking people's stories, putting them on stage? Is that an extraction model? What, how, how can you work with the people that you're interviewing to include them in the, in the whole process so it becomes potentially a piece of community theatre rather than just a, a theatre practitioner going into a community, taking stories and putting them on stage, which is a potentially incredibly extractive model. Um, the risks in the edit are that you manipulate your edit so much to the degree that you are no longer being honest about what the person's original words were or that you use an edit for a particular purpose. I don't think I've always got my edits right. And you can sense that as a practitioner when you know someone's sitting in the audience watching themselves on stage. Um, if you've got the edit slightly wrong, you can really feel that. And I've, I've definitely learned from that process. Um, just trying to think what other main risks are. Ah, the, the main risk is, is in performance itself. I think that for actors, this there's a very fine line here between performing with empathy and the performance tipping into ridicule. And as soon as an actor stops the deep listening process and starts acting, I feel the technique can very quickly turn into one that is about mimicry and ridicule. And the way that lands on stage can be really horrific. So as long as you have a director in the room that really understands the technique and the actors are encouraged to, to be themselves on stage, literally just sharing a voice, I think you minimize the risks of it feeling like ridicule but that risk is is there so the kind of projects that i think this works for and that i'd like to work on more in the future are ones where there is a tension and where there are conversations that aren't happening that need to happen and you can physically then stage those conversations and put people in a room to talk to each other on stage even if they aren't speaking to each other in real life I also think there's an exciting um, future in multilingual headphone verbatim theatre. I worked in a primary school last year to create a piece for the school that celebrated the multilingualism of their students. And to, for the st we had to then have a multilingual cast who could perform in the languages of the children. And for the children to see their languages played back to the rest of the school on stage, um, built so much confidence in their own language use and their own multilingualism and really helped them celebrate it. And actually the impact on the school and those kids academically, because they had far more confidence in talk across all the languages that they use was really interesting. Um, I would really like to share some other demonstrations with Anna and Rajivan now, if that's okay, I can welcome them back. These, um, clips are from the play that I ended up making about sex and relationship education called The Talk. And this has gone mainly to be shared at universities and to be watched by trainee teachers. So to try and encourage more trainee teachers to discuss their own feelings around delivering sex and relationship education and why it can be such a taboo and awkward topic for teachers. There are three clips we're gonna share with you and we're also demonstrating here how in headphone you can cross cast across age, across gender. So you'll see here that, you know, Anna's playing a, a much older woman in one piece, Rajivan's playing um, a woman in another piece. And you'll see that it's just about how well the actors can connect to that voice um, and share it with you. So the pieces, because of the nature of this play being about people's experiences of sex and relationship education, what they wish they'd learnt, why they wish they'd learnt it. I do want to give a warning to anyone that these clips do contain some stories around abuse. There's also mention of suicide. So if for anyone doesn't feel comfortable watching, please just take that warning. Um, but I do hope that you'll see the power of hearing people's stories who may not have wanted, who may not have shared them before um, on these topics. So Anna, if I pass over to you, thank you. Okie doke. Well, I'm a great grandmother as well as a grandmother. I'm 92. 
I went to the uh, primary school, which was in New Elton, where I lived, and there were two boys that frightened the life out of me because they kept poking me. And they said, we're going to get you down the, um, the alley and we're going to take your knickers down. I mean, we're five, for heaven's sake. Funny, isn't it? Sex education, absolutely nil. And we had biology. And, oh, oh, I must tell you too, we were into dogs, my family, and we had a dog called Nelly. And I remember standing there with my father and watching her have her puppies, which I thought was wonderful to see all these little puppies pop out. It was a very, very vivid picture in my mind. The first um, recollection I have of ever talking about sex is that uh, I had this special friend we both had dogs and every Saturday morning we would walk from New Elton to Chislehurst. And I remember distinctively that Joyce telling me about sex. I stopped dead in the middle of my tracks and I said, don't be stupid. My mother and father would have never have done that. It's dirty. Thank you, Anna. That, that piece, Puppies, is, opens the show, the talk. I'm now going to pass on to Rajivan to share a piece. This, this person I interviewed didn't actually want to remain anonymous. So the first piece that Rajivan's going to share with you is by a poet called Simon Madrill. Um, and it was important to him that he wasn't anonymous in the sharing of his words. And the second piece that Rajivan will share with you is from someone who wanted to remain anonymous. So Rajivan will share two pieces with you. Thank you, Rajivan. No one really talks about HIV, he just caught AIDS, which is a remarkably interesting concept. Well, of course, you know, originally it was called the gay cancer. And, you know, to a large degree, it was, was used as a, a weapon by, by the homophobes to justify God's punishment. I actually saw something the other day that said actually 30% of people still think that you can catch HIV through kissing. The ignorance is rife. No, no, I mean, for certain. Everyone should know about PET, post-exposure, prophylaxis. I probably wouldn't have HIV if I'd been properly educated about PET because I had an exposure with someone that then four or five hours later told me that they'd been diagnosed the day before. My brain was in a scramble mess. You know, if, if you know what the morning after pills is, you know what f f fucking PEP is, for God's sake. It was an all-girls school, which was a bit of an experience, to say the least. You had to have navy blue knickers. They were school regulation knickers. And every now and then they double check that that was what you were wearing. And you weren't allowed to have paint and leather shoes because uh, this was associated with the, the navy knickers, believe it or not, because uh, boys might be able to look in your shoes and see your pants. There was one class workshop thing on periods, sponsored by Always. And the other session was a bit more like proper sex ed. It wasn't just about periods, it was about sex and relationships, I think. And parents got letters home to say whether they gave permission to their daughters to go to them. And I think my parents were fine with the periods one and not so fine with the whatever the second one was. I never really knew whether it would have been useful at all, but I guess I assumed it would. I had some fears about sex because they didn't know what it entailed. And the first relationship I was ever in, I didn't really know how to say no, even though I didn't feel right, quite ready. I thought maybe everyone doesn't really like sex and it's a painful thing. I thought maybe it's one of those things that's enjoyable for men and not enjoyable for women. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? There's all sorts of reasons why my parents would have been uncomfortable with, you know, having someone come in and speak to me about sex at school. They would have never had sex with anyone else. My mum was engaged when she was still a child and my parents are both very committed Christians and so they don't believe in sex outside marriage. So I guess from their perspective, what on earth would be the point? So yeah, I don't know if anyone would have been able to persuade my parents that it's okay. I think the school probably shouldn't have sent a letter home saying it's up, turn or opt out. Probably shouldn't have never been asked. They must know that I've had sex now. 
but it's still not something they'd confront. If I go home with, actually, this is an interesting one. If I take a boyfriend home, they make up my brother's bed for him to sleep in. If my brother takes a girlfriend home, she stays in my brother's bed with him. Because boys will be boys, right? And they know that I don't go to church. And they know that I don't believe. We've had that conversation. And it's a shame, actually, because there's things I've wanted to talk to my parents about since that, that I haven't been able to as a result of the fact that we don't acknowledge that I might have sex. So I, I, was, I was date raped at uni. And obviously the thing that you want when something like that happens is the next day when you're pretty distraught to speak to your mum when a very good friend was raped and went through a court case that I was a witness for. I spoke to my mum about that. I spoke to my mum about my friend's rape, but wasn't able to talk about my own. I mean, that's not really, in my mind, that's not really sex, it's an act of violence. But it still falls into a bucket of things me and my mum don't talk about, which I think is a shame, because you just kind of just want a hug from your mum when something like that happens. Thank you so much, Rajivan and Anna, for sharing those. And um, I'm sure we can talk more about headphone verbatim in the Q&A, but now I think I'm going to pass over to Sudha to talk about verbatim in her practice. Thank Thanks, you Sudha. very much, Leela. Um, yeah, so, I mean, for me, you know, as a writer, um, I, I'm not one of these people who sort of sits in a room on my own and creates great works of fiction for my imagination. Um, I've, I've always, I've often been described as a magpie, you know, the bird who will go and collect things that shine and out of these unusual and things that seem so disconnected, you know, make something out of that. I've always found people in their own words really, really powerful, the poetry of the everyday. So when I've had children, for instance, um, you know, I've literally find the way they speak, you just, as a writer, I couldn't make it up. So. I started to use, um, you know, what, what my kids have said. So I wrote a play called Child of the Divide, where the words of my sons would suddenly be put into the mouths of other characters. So Child of the Divide is actually, it's about a lost boy during the time of partition. Uh, and, you know, my young son, when he was going to primary school, he found it quite hard to settle. So we had this game where I would just say to him, you cry, let the ocean out. And then the ocean, you know, as he got settled, it was like, no, mom, today it's a lake. And then the lake became a puddle. But those kind of words that he spoke, I, when I put them into the mouths of a boy who had lost his family during the partition, they took on sort of even more power. And so I started to feel as though, you know, these, this, this is the gems that you make work from. So, you know, Alan Bennett, um, you know, he talks a lot about the writer's suitcase and how He's, when he's trying to go through the airport and he says he has nothing to declare, but the customs officers will open his suitcase and, you know, out comes the skeleton, out comes the photographs, all his, you know, um, sort of dirty linen. And, and that is full of, you know, reminiscence, characters from his past. So he, you know, people have this storehouse of memories that they use as writers. And verbatim is sort of making that more explicit, it's making that relationship more, you know, what we say, to the people that you will interview is that, you know, you are making, you're not just going to quietly listen and then they'll be really surprised because you've stolen their words. You're actually making that, that sort of um, relationship with them. So another writer that I, I, you know, when I started using verbatim is a writer called Robin Soans. You know, he wrote things like the Arab Israeli cookbook where he, he went to, you know, this, uh, he went to Israel and Palestine and tried to look at that conflict through talking to people about their recipes and what they eat. Um, so there was just, um, you know, he talks about the, um, the indispensable rules of verbatim. So the first is don't try to write a political play. If you do, it'll end up agitprop, worthy, one-dimensional and boring. If on the other hand, you write a humanitarian play, it's got every chance of being funny, moving, and political. Secondly, look for the detail and the minutiae in people's lives. Thirdly, never forget that it is someone's life. If people are letting you into their lives, you have to treat them with the respect that they deserve. And fourthly, never prejudge. So the less prejudiced you are when you arrive, 
the more likely that you're going to write a faithful account. So for me, you know, my journey into verbatim, um, you know, I'm actually petrified of head verbatim, so that might be one reason. Um, but I've often used sort of research and interviewing as like the impetus for my fictional work. So I just wanted to share with you two pieces that I've made um, and also with examples from the actors. One of them was a true story that made the headlines in 2006. And it was the story of a young girl called Molly Campbell. Uh, it appeared in the Saturday Guardian. Well, initially it, she, they were on the news. She had run away from home and she was a half Scottish and half Pakistani girl, you know, Pakistani heritage, but her father was still Scottish. And she had been, she had run away from her home in Stornoway and literally Interpol got involved because pretty soon that became a sort of Islam versus the West because her Pakistani father, bearded, wearing a shalwar kameez, was accused of kidnapping her. And then a few days later, she appeared in the hall and, you know, did a news conference and said, you know, I went with my loving father of my own accord and my name is not Molly, my name is Mizbah. And at the time, I sort of ignored the story because it was literally playing into agendas that were bigger than the, the personal family uh, tug of love story. But two years later, an interview appeared in The Guardian. Uh, and I'm sure Neela will share the link in a minute. But um, this is what got me um, uh, uh, sort of interested in this, because behind those headlines was a deeply personal story of love and how that went wrong. You know, a, t to a teenager of 16, um, who was Molly's mother, Louise, and uh, she fell in love with Sajad, the father. He used to run the markets. He was 20. And, you know, he would say that, you know, she was a wee girl sort of tagging along and they, they got friends, you know, made friends. And one leap year, you know, uh, which was when she was 16, she asked him to marry her. So I was really interested in how this love story um, and also, you know, when they got married, she had to convert to Islam, how actually she took on the religion with, with a sort of full sort of immersing herself in it, wanting to belong. And they had four children and how that story became a kind of um, how did it become this sort of political story that made the headlines? I was lucky enough that I actually went to Pakistan. I interviewed the father and the daughter in Pakistan. And then I interviewed the mother in Stornoway. And by then, two years had passed since the headlines. The mother had given up her right. She had, you know, lost her children, as she, as she put it. And I recorded those interviews. I transcribed them. There was a, over 100 pages of transcripts. And I agonized over writing a fictional piece. But I could never, ever get away from their voices. And actually, in the end, my dramaturg, Lynn Coughlin, she encouraged me to actually look at their voices. And I ended up crafting the piece from the verbatim material and from the newspaper headlines. So I just want to share with you now, um, with Hasina, Naveed and Neela, the beginning of the play. So the conceit of the play is that the three of them are talking to me. So Sudha, me, is the audience. And this is how it began. It's like when you sit on a beach on a sunny day and then having a picnic, how wicked is it? But, um, like a million times more better. That's how heaven is. That's how Jannath is. Like Jannath is Jannath. Heaven is heaven. You know when we say one subhanallah, you know? when we say one subhanallah, everyone, every Musliman who's even said la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, even my little sis Sana, she's half my sis, she just thinks it's like twinkle, twinkle little star, but la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But even when she said that, Allah ta'ala ne uskiliye, even for little sana, how big is my heaven? Like Allah ta'ala's already made a heaven for her. It's like our own jannat is up to how much zikr we do and how much we obey Allah ta'ala. When we say one subhanallah, it's near like one ik direct utga. One tree comes out and it's so big that agar, if you get the fastest horse on earth, and if you get him to run under the shadow of the tree, he will run 500 miles and he still wouldn't get to the other end of the shadow. That's how big the tree will come, by just saying one subhanallah. And isa hoge ge, let's be, there will be a river and it can be of any of your flavor. Like if you want it to be of chocolate, like this is what Papa told us, like if I was, you'll get a chocolate. It's true. 
You can get anything you want. It's like a river. You can even get a chocolate milkshake river. And if you go inside, then there'll be another world. Sanai, idra. Oh, salam karo. Buri baate. My new little girl, she's pretending to be shy. Got my kitty last week. Come here, give me cuddles. Still have to give the toe rag a name. I was desperate to have something, some, someone, some little heartbeat to come home to, make me smile because I don't have my children. Two years. Gabby's door is still shut. My kitty comes and lies beside me at night. I'm lost. Only a mother in my situation can hear my screams, which are inside. The other day in Glasgow, I, uh, I saw a white woman um, in a shalwa kameez and I wanted to go up to her and scream, your family are not safe. And I had to stop myself. Nadeem beta, is cup of garam karo. Heat cup before drinking. Hmm? I hate cold tea. Beta, sit down. Hmm? Well, Sudha has come all the way from London to talk to us. I have to cut down on sugar. Dr. Nikahahe, lose the weight. Blood pressure, sugar. You can pay attention to yourself in Pakistan. You have the time. Well, at the time, we spoke to so much media. What is left to say after two years? Deko, hamare Islam mein, it's pabandi, not zabardasti. Yeah. Susie did a good job, I'll give her that. She had zazba. I had to try hard because she's a gori. We're Muslims. You know, we have kalma, Allah, and our kitab, the holy book. Susie's culture is when you're 16, get out. I'm easy to find. With the media, every taxi in Stornoway knows me. Susie Imri, local celebrity. I was made out to be absolute trash. The media s slashed me to pieces. When it first happened, they descended on me from everywhere. It was a case of a, um, I was mental you know, me mentally deranged, uh, alcoholic, drug taker, and uh, my partner all tattooed, you know, we were just scum. And Lenny is the most politest gentleman you have ever come across. Um, he's never hit anyone in his life. Doesn't have a tattoo. He's got scars where he let his dog chew into his arm. The dog was dying because he fell out of a window. Mama, in a way, she somehow got that figure in her head that Papa did really bad with her. Like Papa turned her into a Muslim. And so what happened, Gabe? Mama, cause she knew Papa loved me. He would do anything for me, you know? Cause I was the youngest. I was like, When's Papa coming? I tell my granny, Dadi Popo, Papa Kobolano, Danali. So Mama knew if I'll get Gazala, then she'll get back to, to, at Papa. Do you get it? All the newspapers, they go there. They all take sides. It was not me who kidnapped my daughter, it was Susie who kidnapped Gazala from me. I was still Farhan from Glasgow. Yet suddenly, I was this bearded Muslim jihadi, fundamentalist. You tell me, why didn't she fight for custody of the older kids? She knows she has lost them. So the media. And I, I couldn't respond. What's been said in the papers, it's way too sore. All of it way too sore and just shows a tiny, tiny part, like an absolute fraction of what we all went through. 
what the children went through. Abducted, Gabby Orgazala, tug of love schoolgirl. Mother of all battles, fundamental clash of two cultures. If it was a movie, it would be a blockbuster. Girl snatched from school gates and taken to Pakistan for forced marriage. Barbaric practice amongst third world immigrants. Fears grow for a kidnap bride. Mentally unstable mum left devastated. Gabby or Ghazala. Life with mum was a living hell. I am not a runaway. Love affair that became a war and the children who became its weapons. British media reporting akin to psychological side of the so-called war on terror. I love Scotland, but I love Islam more. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that was the beginning of the play. Um, I mean, when, you know, when it was performed, it was obviously the, you had to imagine the voices being, you know, Scottish accents, but what was wonderful about the, the in a way, in, their voices captured in their own words, gave that play its kind of nuance and complexity. The story that had been reduced into an Islam versus the West was sort of unpacked through their own words. And actually, you know, as the play went on, the media headlines that they that they respond to um you know are there in the backdrop and we sort of uncover it, and you very much get the feeling of them sort of looking back you know two years ago so that's that sort of gave it its uh, conversation across continents as one of the um, reviewers called it but you know the three of them were on stage and they would invade each other's stories borrow each other's words and verbatim was used in a, in, a, in a sort of more, there was an imaginative leap from the real people. I had changed the names. And this is one of the things like when Neela was talking about in the headphone verbatim, you are, as a writer or as a creator of this work, you are juggling, you know, these are real people, you know, who, who, who will come to see the show. And indeed that is something that you, you've always got that, you know, that's your emotional labor. You're there to make sure that you don't do what the media had already done to them. Uh, you know, it took me six years to sort of navigate that, to keep in touch with the family. And I was delighted when actually the mother and the daughter came to see the show, the father was in Pakistan. And one of the things that really struck me was Molly, who by the time she saw the show, she was actually 19. And I had interviewed her when she was 14. And what she said afterwards was watching the show, you know, it was my words, but not spoken by me. She said, I saw myself as a, as a 10, 11 year old, and actually what I realized was that I was innocent. And so I felt that that was something, if I had helped her, you know, that was one moment that struck with me that actually watching your story back, that, you know, it can be something that's cathartic, but it is, it's a fine balance, definitely. So the other example I'd like to share with you is a project that I'm working on at the moment. It's called Touchstone Tales, and it's a commission by Revoluton Arts in Luton and Welcome Collection. And this is an example of where art and science, you know, can work together um, because the Radio 4 and the Welcome Collection, they commissioned a, a, the world's largest study on, on the sense of touch. And it, it was called the Touch Test. And indeed, this week on Radio 4, there are programs which are revealing the results of that study. So 40,000 people have taken part in that study. And the kind of things they're looking at is, you know, what is the role of touch in terms of well-being? What does touch mean in your life? Uh, the concept of touch, hunger, you know, actually hunger, you know, a sort of longing for touch, which is not there, which is made, you know, ever more sort of poignant during this time of COVID. So there was the scientific study. And at the same time, Welcome and Revoluton commissioned an artist response. So I, I have been resident um, in Luton, although, you know, I was physically going there and doing a lot of engagement work, but also now it's a lot of it, it's had to come online. And indeed the canvas of the absence of touch has become the sort of um, frame around this work. And so what I've been doing is looking at this, looking at the, um, the, the touch test and through workshops, through creative encounters, 
have been interviewing and talking to people about their lives through the theme of touch. And I've written a series of monologues and a duologue. And we also had, um, it was Ramadan during lockdown this year. So we invited the uh, people in Luton to submit how they, how they actually marked Ramadan when they could not be a sort of convivial and very much a communal event became, you know, people were in their own homes. Indeed, Hasina Raja contributed to that film. She's a Lutonian. Um, so there was a, you know, there's a crowdsourced film and this body of work that I have written alongside blogs and, and, and a lot of other sort of sharings. So I'd like to share with you um, two excerpts from monologues. And the first one, um, before we sort of hear the excerpt, the, the, the piece is called The Ninja Sister. And it came about from me interviewing a, a girl called Hasina Rahman, who is the founder of the Pink Diamond Martial Arts Club. And so she, you know, she is an expert in sort of martial arts, mixed martial arts, Thai boxing. And she got, she came to that through being bullied uh, in school. And she now runs this female only club. And it is, you know, there are a lot of very many sort of Muslim participants, but also, you know, people from other faiths, female only, they come there and they spar and they learn martial arts, they you know, gain confidence, they touch, they spar. Uh, it's very much a contact sport. Now they're doing it on Zoom. So I've done workshops with them, interviews with them. And from that verbatim, which I took as a starting point, I wrote this short story, a short monologue called The Ninja Sister, which combines verbatim and fiction. So Hasina, please, if you could share the extract now. The cool clique at school, they were all hijabis, Lutonian sisters. It's in our DNA. The older ones set the trend with all the colors and patterns that betrayed their personalities, contour makeup and smoky eyeliner to set off the look. Some of the girls, like me, were more sober with our choices. We got checked, but obviously there's a boundary created and the brothers know not to cross it unless they, the girls want them to and they're gonna put a ring on it even the non-Muslim men see hijab as a stop sign, like, do not approach. Look, but do not touch, inviting the idea of consent. I was good with that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my papa to bits. But in the end, it wasn't her that helped me dig deeper. That came much later. I'm 19 and stood alone outside Pandora's in town centre checking out all the latest gems, listening to Adele's hometown glory on my headphones. That was a bad idea. The headphones, not Adele. My bracelet's already quite full, marking the years and touchstone moments. Simba and Mufasa sunset, just because I love the Lion King. The roots and tree charm from the fam for my 16th. Rainbow and rose for my A-levels. And Zara got me the friends of the family you choose dangle charm when we left school. On our last day, she came in to give me a squeeze, but then knew to back off. I felt bad as she was moving to Birmingham for good, but I'm only huggable at home. I had my eye on the copper and silver, spread your wings and fly angel in the window. I just helped deliver my first baby, not mine. I've always wanted to be a midwife and now it was coming true. Maybe because I'm the baby at home. I love seeing new mums bond with their babies, touching skin to skin. That's when I saw them coming. Three of them, with their football hoodies, boots, and wide white boy swagger. They surrounded me. One of them tried to unzip my coat. So you got an Insta name then? It was afternoon, so the center was quiet. Plus, they were subtle. No one noticed that I was frozen to the spot. Like I had been at the hospital. When a porter was helping me move a patient who just had a C-section, he was going behind me. There was plenty of space, but he still brushed his arms across my back, resting for too long on my waist. Man, why? Was that necessary? But I just, I just kind of took it. Like today, it had just taken me by surprise. Then, alhamdulillah, 
out of nowhere, she was there floating in full niqab, gloves and everything. They were like, what's your Insta name then, Ninja? Her voice like projected through the net on her mouth and just cut through. Get lost, you losers. What do you think you're doing? It speaks. They started making ninja sounds and laughing. Yeah, like what are you gonna do? One of them put his hands on her wrist. She just calmly picked it up and pushed him away with such force. He went flying and they just backed away, totally shocked and ran. Show confidence, sister. No one, like no one has the right to touch you without your permission. The C word confidence. Like, where was I supposed to find that? I didn't end up buying that charm because my wings had been clipped before I'd learned to fly. You can't let them get away with this or they'll do it again. She marched me to security and made me file a report. I told her I thought the hijab was supposed to send a message against unwanted attention. But she was like, covering up is not for sending messages to others or hiding a bad hair day. It's for you to feel special as a woman and be closer to your creator. I'd never thought of it like that before. Self-defense, you can learn. Thank you very much, Hasina. So, I mean, what was great about that process was, you know, there was a sort of layers of it from me interviewing Hasina Rahman to doing a workshop with other participants from the club to them, come, you know, sending um, material for the Ramadan film. And each step of the way, like when I wrote a blog, you know, I sort of shared it with them. When I wrote this monologue, I shared it with them. So at the end of it, you know, they actually felt like they, they could see themselves in the story. So even though it was no one person, they felt that they, they had been listened to and that it was their collective story. So that's what, you know, I try to navigate. Um, it's, it's, it's a delicate thing. It doesn't always work, but that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, I'd like to share a second extract. Now, this piece is called The Eid Hug. And I interviewed a man who was sort of probably in his early 50s, uh, you know, British Pakistani. And what really struck me, again, you know, like in the, in the headphone verbatim, I interviewed him, recorded it, and it's when I listen back and deeply listen and, and actually transcribe. I find that transcribing is, is laborious, but that's in, in a way that's another part of the listening. And through that, for me, the story that struck me, his story, was how he craved for his father's hug. Um, so he said how, you know, his father just seemed to exist on Eid uh, because that's the only time they got the hugs. But how that relationship, he sort of, he, he's very sort of gentle with his father because he realizes that it's also he's a product of his time. And now as a father himself, he is much more tactile and available uh, for his children. So um, Naveed actually, for the, this time, you know, sometimes we share, so I actually asked Naveed if he wanted to hear the real person, and he actually did. Uh, but the job in this case, when I've been, you know, when I've been sort of uh, freer with the material is not for the actor to emulate but to bring something of themselves they're not trying to be the person that they're hearing they're they're being a fictional character that they bring their own essence to so here is um naveed with an extract of the eid hug i used to think does dad only exist on eid day the rest of the time even though he was visible to us we were invisible to him but on eid day he stand up his arms outstretched, oh, milo, 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 and scoop you up into a hug so pure. It, it spoke more than he ever said in words. Now, if you hadn't washed up, for example, hadn't dressed or hadn't prayed, you're not supposed to receive that hug because you're not a complete person yet. Now, with my head on his chest, I love to say, we've been here for the last seven, eight months as well, Dad. It was his upbringing or... He wasn't articulate enough to think, well, hang on, I love my son to bits. Let's put my arm around him and say, how's your day been, Putta? You're supposed to know the love and affection was there because parents said they'll die for you. Everything they're doing is for you. Dad was a taxi driver. Mum sewed skirts and blouses in the house and clothes she never wore herself. 
uh, given their circumstances, they lost themselves in the circumstances. I'm the eldest of 10. My elder among the sisters looked after younger siblings. And as us brothers got married, sister and daughter the same. You didn't crave the touch you didn't know. I remember mum used to hold my smallest finger at night when I'm lying down and, and, and rub that finger all, all the time talking about the thieves who would come if I didn't go to sleep. In the story, the thieves, um, they, they go to steal something or, the, the, or their noses get stuck, noses get cut or something. And they, well, we always said, tell us that story again. Yeah, like thieves, we wanted to steal more time with her. She was my rock. And now I'm hers. Now, I think I got to know back in the village in Kashmir. Now, dad had sent her back with my brother and I and uh, a sister who had just been born. Now, for 11 years, he came to visit us only about twice. Now, bless them, my dad's parents embraced her wholeheartedly. But it's always others, to be honest with you, the, the community. Now, whenever there was a conflict, she would get, she's outsider, you know, non-Muslim, blah, blah, that kind of thing, yeah? Indirectly. Then I heard it directly from my favorite uncle. Now, my first memory of a hug is from him, when he lifted me up in the village and, and made me feel secure. Now, we've not seen eye to eye since he dropped the bombshell. Our mum was Sikh before, before she met dad. Now, I started liking someone in sixth form college. Yeah, same faith, same caste, everything. Father found out. Not having it over my dead body, you know. Objection was perception of other people. Now, he married out of the family. Don't question him. But his kids were promised within the clan. Now, I came to a stage, if he's in the front room, I'll go in the back room. If he's in the back, I'll go in the front. If he's downstairs, I'll go upstairs. If he's upstairs, I'll go downstairs. Avoidance from both of us because i was questioning him now she's same faith same bloody brothery you know same ticking boxes what's the problem his answer was to marry me to my cousin and for her two brothers to marry my two sisters a triple deal a range of one of dad's handshakes all three marriages now failed <laughs> yeah it's, it's like east is east but better and this is a live issue, yeah? same twist in the story as well. Dad was married already. Mum was wife number two. Yeah, she didn't know. Now show me a household in Luton who doesn't have issues of relationships, a divorce. We call our WhatsApp group the royal family, the best, including the broken marriages. Now just brothers and sisters, yeah? No room for extras and the grandkids. We're close-knit, we bail each other out. And just like the queen, mums accepted our new loves. Our sisters, they suffered in silence the first time round, but now their husbands, they mind the kids while they go for their chill-outs with their friends once a week. I approached my uh, eldest daughter when I was asked for her hand by a cousin, by, uh, by a cousin for his son. At least have a conversation, yeah? It's your decision. Dad? I will not be going back home to marry a yardie. He's not a yardie. Luton boy, yeah, works at the airport. Hamza, he likes cooking. Dad, we need to widen the gene pool. Can't argue with that. I said, bottom line, as a father, I'll never raise that again. Thank you very much, Naveed. Um, so, Nilo, if you would kindly share, um, there is a second instalment of stories in this Touchstone Tales. So if any of you are interested, it's, there is an online event um, next Thursday, the 15th, and you can sign up for that. And all the Radio 4 programs are, are available to listen again as well so to find out more about the Touch Test. So I think um, that's sort of pretty much the journey of, um, you know, how we've been using verbatim as sort of a whistle-stop tour through. Um, I think uh, if we could invite uh, Amina, Dr. Amina Yakin, to come back and this is the time for you to ask questions and you know for people to open up the chat as well. We're all here. 
please put your videos back on. Thank you very much, uh, Sudha and Neela and Naveed, Husina, Anna, um, for, and Rajivan for such a wonderful um, and exciting treat that you've held in store for us. I didn't quite know that we were going to be um, sort of creatively led in so many ways. Uh, so it's a real, I think, um, exciting journey. It's been a very exciting journey to listen to the personal narratives as well as the, the techniques and the methodology and the examples. So a, a, a fascinating journey. Thank you for sharing it with us. And I'm also delighted to welcome Suman from the creative team, Suman Butcher, who wasn't um, at the, with us at the start. Um, and I, I would like to invite um, Suman to say a few words, um, but before I do, just ask the audience that we would be um, very interested in getting your questions. You can use the chat box to post your questions. It is now open or as has uh, as been indicated in the side panel, you can raise your hand. Our wonderful administrator, Sunil Pan, is, is sort of um, invisibly in the background making all of this work brilliantly. So thank you to Sunil for that. And if you can put your question in the chat box, then I will invite you to come forward and ask your question as well in person on screen. Uh, if you don't want to ask it in person, just put that in the chat box and we'll, we'll just read it out aloud. Um, and um, yeah, so I hope that, that you all have some stuff um, that you might wish to ask the team about. Um, Suman, you've been instrumental to all of this. And um, I think uh, it would be really interesting to hear your perspective on all of what has been talked about this evening with regards to verbatim and also, um, you know, from your lens, what, what, what sort of, what's your involvement and how do you kind of make the, I, I mean, I've had the pleasure and the honor to get to, to speak to Sudha and Suman and Neela over the time of this development of the decolonizing project that you did at SOAS, but I think, the audience would, would love to hear more about your, your sort of inspiration and your journey within, within the project as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Amina. Mm -hmm. Well, it is fascinating, lovely to see all the work here. Um, in short, my own background is actually in documentary King, and I was thinking when Sudha and Neela were discussing about how you listen deeply and transcribe, that is something that I've spent a lot of time doing, but in the kind of television documentaries that tell stories about the Asian community in Britain, and the same sort of rules apply in that you don't really want um, to be dishonest about the person that you are talking about, they, you tell their story, but you have to cut and edit uh, and so on. And there are different rules. We may not follow the chronology rule in the same way as we follow it for headphone item that Neela was mentioning, but we do follow a rule that the the story that the you know, how we've come into this technique. But the main thing is that, you know, I've been coming to us to hear at, at the events and so on, and I got to, to uh, Dr. Edward Simpson, who is the, was the head of the SOA South Asia Institute about how it would be great is. to see if we can do some more theater yeah. work with the university. Yeah, okay. You're yeah, breaking up quite a lot, so yeah. Okay, well, I'll try and be brief, basically, just to say that, I mean, everything has happened serendipitously in a way. I used to come to service to listen to the talks. I was interested in the university about trying to do some theatre work, and it grew organically out of there. This was a topic very much being discussed at diversity, not only SOAS, but also other universities. And again, this rule, we decided that we should have a 
conversation within one university as a microcosm of trying to look at the subject of decolonization within the curriculum and see if um, speaking in one space tells us a human story that is wider than that. Were you able to hear all this? Was that okay? Okay, Most I give up. It, yes, I think so. So Yeah, that's um, fine. We'll, we'll, I'll come back to you again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, great. Uh, there are some questions. So it's best yes. to go to the questions, really. Yeah. There are some questions popping up in the chat box, so I can, um, if, uh, sh and I'm going to try and get, pronounce the names as, um, as best I can, so apologies if I get this pronunciation wrong. Shatarupa Mishra, would, would you like to come forward with your question, please? Can you unmute? Yeah, go ahead, Shatra. Uh, you're you're on, uh, but you need to unmute your your um, sound. Maybe we should just right. ask the question. Okay. Super. So, so Shatra's question is: Please tell me a little bit about how verbatim theatre functions in the speaking for others discourse. Shall we take a few uh, a few more, and then perhaps you could respond to them as as a panel um, all together, or perhaps yes. Why don't you just read out a few? Mm -hmm. So, Unati, um, are you there? Okay, Unati, um, yeah, would you like to put your question across, Unati? Can you? Uh, yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, so my question is for Sudha, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is there a play or a concept that uh, talks about the Indian colonial experience? And um, also, could you shed some light on what languages are a part of the verbatim theater that you practice? Like I could hear some Hindi. So could you shed light on that, on what languages do you use? Thank you. You want me to answer now? Would you like to, Uh Yes, I mean, I don't, you know, in terms of a play about the colonial experience, you know, I don't know of any one particular play. Um, you know, I can imagine, uh, you know, this technique would be very good for something like that. But for me, like, I'm always interested in how, you know, there isn't one colon colonial experience, if you like, you know, it is, I'm always interested in like, ordinary people and what they go through. So when, when we're talking about Brexit, or we're talking about the partition of India, you know, if you go and talk to the people on whose lives are being affected, uh, and that's when you get a sort of textured uh, piece, I feel. Um, and in terms of the languages, I mean, I do use, yeah, as, even as, as Neela said, you know, it, it can, if you're recording people and how they speak, so there's a sort of multilingual, you know, where even in the play My Name Is, you know, when, when I recorded the young girl and she was going in and out of Urdu and she had a Scottish accent, I think that's what adds to, you know, making that piece very nuanced. So, yes, I've, I mean, I can speak Punjabi, Urdu and... Um, you know, Hindi, uh, you know, uh, conversationally. So I, I always include them if people use them when, when they're being interviewed. Okay, great. I wondered if, uh, would any of the actors who are using languages, did they want to add anything to that? Naveed, Hasina. Didn't have any anything to add. It, it normally helps. Um, it just helps with the char the character really. So as soon as there's a splatter of a different language, um, I uh, it's great for me because it's it's uh, takes you the character to a different place. Um, it, it helps building the character basically for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, Hasina, did you want to add anything? No, I think Naveed pretty much said it. I echo what he says. It really helps um, create the scene and the backdrop for the character to give the audience an insight to where they're coming from. I think it just adds the layers to it. So it's really useful. Okay, 
Great, thank you. So we have some more questions popping up. Uh, Annie, Annie George, are you there? Would you like to push your question across, please? I don't know if Annie's there. Okay, I'll, I'll read Hello. Annie's question. Um, Annie's question is for Neela with, um, with HP verbatim, I guess, in the edit. What do you do when, when an interviewee is telling a good story and goes off on a tangent, as so often happens in real life? Do you ever edit out the tangential story or does that become part of it? Great question. So. Yeah, thank you, um, Annie. Uh, for me, like, I think originally when I started off interviewing, if someone went off on a tangent or what I believe to be a tangent, I think probably in my earlier interviews, I'd try and steer them back on course. But I've quickly learned that the tan what you think are tangents often aren't. Um, and someone's actually trying to tell you something, um, even if it seems to you tangential, it's not for them. Um, I often just let what I perceive to be a tangent just run its course in the in the interview. Um, and sometimes trust that when I listen back, I'll figure out why that person wanted to share that at that time, because there's often a reason that I can't see until I've listened back to it three or four times. Sometimes I'll just end up editing that section out because it will be literally a tangent that's not not useful or, or relevant. Um, but often I'll find there's a reason why they why they shared that particular aspect with me. So it's a mixture. But yes, you you have the power to edit things in and out, which is why for me I don't necessarily call this technique like an like authentic I think is often a word that gets used because as soon as you edit anything that anyone says you are making a manipulation um, and so I am very aware that you're manipulating in some ways what somebody has said you're just trying to do it in the most ethical way possible which is which is the, the hard part I think I hope that answers a little bit okay thank you um how about Areej? Can you join us to ask your question? Because it's, it's um, a very short question and I don't know whether you wanted to elaborate on it. Yeah, Areej? Hi, sorry, <laughs> I didn't expect to speak. Um, I just like to say that I think the actors did a brilliant job um, and also the pieces were very well written. Um, I find myself reading a lot about, I guess, um, lately, I've been reading a lot about uh, Marxist theater and, and uh, specifically in relation to uh, Brecht. And I'm just wondering, uh, this is my first time coming across verbatim theater, and I'm wondering what greater role or, or purpose does it serve in terms of, um, I guess, uh, development or change of, of any kind? Because all theater has a purpose to at least uh, present uh, a story or, or any um, event or, or something in a particular way that kind of leaves their audience feeling something and thinking maybe they don't have control over that but they themselves can at least um, uh, control the narrative so I'm, I'm wondering what is the purpose of verbatim theater in that sense in terms of development or social change or along those lines oh, could I start with just because um, one of the practitioners of verbatim theatre that Neela mentioned, which is Anna Devere Smith, um, and you know she does pieces that are very much um, you know social drama, what people would call social dramas. I could, if I could just quote from her, um, in her, her recent piece that I saw, which looked at the poverty to prison pipeline uh, for Black American young people, and it was called Notes from the Field. Um, and it exposes a justice system that pushes youth of color living in poverty into prison. So this is what she says in, in, her, in her introduction. She says, sometimes there is an expectation that in as much as I am doing social dramas, I am looking for solutions to social problems. In fact, though, I am looking at the processes of the problems. Acting is a constant process of becoming something. It is not a result. It is not an answer. It is not a solution. I'm first looking for the humanness inside the problems or the crises. The spoken word is evidence of this humanness. Perhaps the solutions come somewhere further down the road. 
And I think she's put that really well in a sense, what verbatim can do, as Neela also said, is to bring contentious conversations into one platform. People that, you know, even, um, you know, with the SOAS project that we did, one of the observations was that, you know, the, the, the conversations aren't necessarily happening with each other, perhaps because people don't know they can have them or why are they not having them. But when we have managed to record them, we're presenting them as if they were happening in the same room. It helps to sort of uncover the humanness of something. So I think that's what, what, it, what is very powerful about verbatim. I don't know if you want to add anything then, anyone else? Yeah. I was wanting to link that to the question earlier that I think someone didn't manage to unmute for, but it's in the chat, which is around, um, I think the question is how, how does verbatim theatre link to the speaking for others discourse? Um, I'm not fully aware of that discourse. I've tried to do a, a quick Google to check that my gut instinct about what it is is correct. And I think it is about who gets to tell whose stories and who, um, which I think links to that idea of extraction, which for me, if you're dealing with, kind of social issues and complex social topics using this form, then I think you do have to be incredibly aware of when you are potentially trying to speak for others. And there's a big difference. I think I get frustrated if verbatim theatre is phrased as it's giving people a voice. It's not giving people a voice because everyone has a voice. It's just some people aren't being listened to as, as much as other people. Um, so, as a, as a practitioner myself, um, not every project should be one that I should be involved in. And I think that's an important thing as, as an artist to, to remember that not all projects should be yours or ones that you can go forward with. You might not be the right person to go and collect stories on a particular topic. You might be someone who can support others to do that. Um, and I think that for headphone verbatim, what's great about it is you can teach the form and the technique to other people so fast. Like you just need a phone or an MP3 player to record. They need to know the ethics of getting something signed and a release form, how to edit online. Um, and then you can also train people to do the technique as well. And so if you're running projects in community theater, then you can actually train everybody to do that technique and then go away and make their own theater. And sometimes that's far more powerful than kind of saying, I'm the one who needs to make this show um, rather than I might be able to support in some way of other people telling, making the show that they want to make. Um, not sure I always get that right, but try. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers two questions in some ways, I hope a little bit. I saw your hand go up. Did you want to add something? Thanks. Yeah, well, there are a few questions on the side that I was trying to see if I could attempt to answer. Uh, one was around the issue of um, uh, how can we support the decolonizing the curriculum in sp schools and colleges? And is there a publication of the transcripts of this show? And then um, there was another thing about can verbatim theatre does verbatim theatre avoid critique because it's perceived to be more authentic than using the, because of using the words of the interviewees? And a third one was about when we first put the show on, what kind of response did we get? Did, were we able to incorporate the um, responses of the interviewees? So trying to answer them in a general way. Um, yeah, I suppose, you know, for us, this is a show that's been evolving. And as I was trying to say earlier on that uh, what we decided to work with one university because it felt like a microcosm of the conversation that was happening all around us. Uh, we feel that the show is still growing. And yes, I guess in the future we could think about publication and so on, but it's not something that we've really thought about very deeply. Um, in terms of the response, we did have some good feedback when we performed it as a kind of a work in progress to the SOAS community last year. But I think that uh, there was also a general conversation because some people, that is the difficulty about uh, verbatim theatre is that not everybody wants to talk to us. And we did think about that when we were doing the thing that how do we incorporate the people who do not wish to talk to us, their voices into the story and do we incorporate their voices or is their silence a voice in itself? So um, yes, the response was good, but you know, obviously we haven't been able to speak to everybody and um, 
Does it avoid critique? I don't think so, because I think when you're looking at the show or you're judging it, I hope that you are looking at it as a, a play, a documentary theater, uh, as a show, because even though the actors are not parodying the voices, they are being authentic and empathetic, I think you do get a sense of what's the story? How does the story work? Does it make you laugh? Does it make you cry? You know, all those emotions that we associate with a different type of theatre. So those are my kind of answers to those questions. But Ila and Sudha, Anna, you've had a lot of experience doing verbatim theatre. You might have a view on this critique question. Yes, please, the actors do, do uh, join the discourse. <laughs> Is Anna there? She's joining Anna. <laughs> Hello? Um, as in the critique of like, what do you mean as in? How do you respond to the word authentic, you know? and, and Yeah, yeah cause me and Neela had a similar, we had a conversation about this, didn't we? This, the authenticity for the performer is different to the authenticity, authenticity of the maker. So they're two different things. Um, and mean two different things. Um, so for the performer, for us, um, it's it's really it's really insincere for me to do a version of this person. Um, and like Neela was saying at the beginning, like I just don't feel that I would give a uh, an honourable performance of this person's testimony when I'm. Um, not being authentic and the authenticity comes in the actual listening um, and the skill as well is actually it's a real there's multiple things going on in your head at the same time because you're one beat behind that person's voice so you're I, I, I couldn't tell you what I said um, so you're so as Nina was saying so deeply trying to listen um, on, a, on a really kind of very quick thinking very quickly as well um, to try and capture how that person is saying it. Um, but at the same time, not trying to, being aware as an actor, not trying to layer anything on top of it um, and trusting that what you're doing is enough. Because I think sometimes you can get tempted to, you don't realize even over time, like we were told from the directors not to over rehearse because it's not like a play where you're rehearsing it. You can actually, go off track if you over rehearse in your room is actually just enough to familiarize yourself um, in case there's like words that you're not, you know, you're not quite catching because of the way they're speaking, but to a point where you can keep it so fresh and your listening is fresh every single time. Um, so that is the skill and the authenticity is as just the authenticness of the listening and saying, I, this is what I'm hearing and, and I'm going to relay that to you um, and, and nothing else, keeping it that simple. Um, Rajiv, what do you, what do you think? Um, I think something Neela mentioned before about uh, whose story it is to tell, uh, something happens with the performer as well, where I think you can feel like you're not sure if you're quite the right person to embody that, even though it's, you know, anyone can, do anyone's voice but there's this idea of you know is it ethical for me to be playing a woman who's talking about a particular ex sexual experience or something so that can that can be quite difficult as a performer to get your head around and think about how can I do that authentically or how can I do that uh, respectfully um, but I think this is maybe one of the only mediums where that can be done uh, because because you are just being a conduit for that for that voice in its entirety. I just on that note, and in regards to casting in headphone verbatim, um, I think the first thing you do in a, in a rehearsal room is you just let the actors choose pieces that they want to try out. And then you work out who, who channels that voice best, who's the most accurate, who do you really feel can just let go of themselves and deliver that voice as close as possible to who that person is. But then there is this additional layer of, well, those casting decisions, what message do they give? Are you giving a particular message? Is anything deeply uncomfortable? Why is it uncomfortable? Is it uncomfortable for the performer, for the audience? Would it be uncomfortable for the interviewee? Um, you then have all these 
all these other complex questions in a, in a, in a casting decision on this. Um, I think you, the headphone verbatim would fall flat, like, like Rajiv and said, like if I'd have done the show, the talk, and it had lots of um, voices in it that talked about sexual assault and sexual abuse. Many of those voices were women, but not, not all. Um, if my entire cast was, was people who identified as male, that might feel incredibly uncomfortable and wrong um, to work with that cast. So if you've got a, the right cast, you can cross cast, but you have to think really carefully about individual stories and whether the how that would feel for the person if they're watching whose voice it actually is um, so there's a lot going on in making those decisions but from an empathy perspective if it's all about putting yourself in someone else's shoes then also seeing actors do that I find quite powerful because if, if you can watch an actor do that which is what actors do anyway in their jobs every day they're always putting themselves in other people's shoes but in headphone it feels very like direct then the actors are kind of modeling that for the audience um, and that I find quite interesting. You don't, I don't always get it right, I don't think, though. There's lots of other questions. That's, that's fascinating. I was just, if I can ask a question um, with regards to empathy and the actor and the headphone production, because I suppose in, in, a, in a creative writing piece, you might have you have your villainous well you might have a villainous character or you might have a negative character and a positive character and portrayals and as an actor you have a little bit of freedom to to kind of add bits or ref um, maybe not do bits that you might feel comf un totally uncomfortable doing i was just wondering in the verbatim performance what like do you because you're doing this as documentary theater what if you as an actor have completely no empathy with what is being said. And you do feel that I actually don't want to do this. How do you work that situation through as a professional and uh, as someone whose job it is to draw empathy, but knowing that you can't, does a documentary form mean that you can't make any changes? Mm. Um, as for me, I, I, with the headphone stuff, I, I think headphone the, the, the verbatim. I suppose you you can't, but um, with the right with 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 um, sort of stuff that I've worked with, it, it depends on what sort of's written down. Then I, that's the actor's job. You have to perform what's been written, and you have to find your way to do it and to believe what you're saying is what you believe in. That's that's the, the actor's job, which is obviously if there's something you're really not happy with, then you can talk about it, but um, and and then refuse to do it. But we can't just change bits. That's the re responsibility. I suppose it's an added responsibility because it's verbatim that you have to get it right because it's someone else's words. That's how I feel. Um, mm. I think it's also. I think it's also. For me, like some of the pieces I heard were, you know, there were there were a lot more and some of them really a lot more political that I didn't always agree with, but I had to say it. Um, so for me, I think it was about removing myself out of the way in the sense that, you know, it's not about me. It's actually particularly with headphone verbatim. It's about I'm here to serve this story. Um, and so I'm going to remove myself and make it about this person's story um, and that enabled me as an actor to have that empathy to say it's not about whether I agree or not but I'm here to be a vessel to um, deliver uh, these words. Thank you that, that that's really interesting fascinating to think through so I think uh, some someone you picked up quite a few questions from the chat box there and uh, the, the one about decolonizing the curriculum in schools and colleges, I think, has been addressed in education. Um, and I think um, if I can add something from the play, because I watched the decolonizing, um, not just a buzzword show, when it was done at SOAS. And, and certainly one of the questions that it picked up was the question of how history is taught in um, the curriculum. And that, that led to a really interesting conversation uh, both with the audience and with the within the performance itself. So I think there there's some some kind of things that connect 
with the broader discussions that are taking place um, at the moment around uh, the curriculum in schools. And, and so I think it would be fascinating for, for something like this to, to go into beyond the university sector as well. Um, so there was a question from Imrana Mahmood, um, which is, is there a risk that verbatim theater avoids critique because it is framed as being more authentic due to using the words of interviewees? I'm not sure if this has been answered yet or if. Nina, did you have something to add to that? I don't think it should avoid critique at all. Um, never. Um, and I, I think that's the risk is, I think there is a risk there that verbatim is presented or oh, this is people's real words so that you can't argue with it. But ultimately uh, somebody has edited that um, and you could, someone could, should always critique my, my way of editing something, um, totally. Sometimes, I, think, yeah. I don't know about how you feel Nina, but sometimes actually verbatim theatre can get I mean, I've certainly heard, you know, oh, but you didn't write that play. So, you know, where's the, you know, where's the sort of, if, if you've just taken someone's words as if it's easier somehow, you know, to edit um, and there's no authorial kind of narrative. Uh, so that's sometimes things that you have to address or people find people who, who like work that is, you know, muscular and in your face and has a narrative that has high stakes, you know, I find that a lot of the time people don't, they don't really warm to verbatim. So it's also a question of taste as well, isn't it? You know, what sort of work people like to see. Okay, I see a hand up from Iram, Iram Dahar. Are you there? Yeah, would you like to put your question across, please? Oh, okay. Iram says it was an accident. Okay. Uh, well, you have the opportunity if you want to ask something. Um, <clears throat> there's some comments about um, expressing from people expressing um, from attendees expressing their appreciation of the panel and the presentations and the interesting work that's being done by the wonderful team here. So we're nearly coming to the end of our time as it is. So I was just wondering if we can perhaps get some last comments in from, from the panelists with regards to today's, um, today's kind of title, which was the Baton Theatre looking uh, beyond, was it binaries, looking beyond binaries? And I was interested in that title, um, the, the use of binaries. And I was just wondering if, if we could, if, if you might be willing to just unpack that a little bit for us before we wind up. I think, yeah, I mean, you know, it is very, this is a technique which is um, very much the opposite of, you know, arguments of for or against black and white. So, so when you have, I mean, certainly in my piece, you had the binary of Islam versus the West and how the media had manipulated, okay. you know, a story into that. Um, and this, you know, this allows you to, to give um, nuanced and detailed pictures and not to, in a non-judgmental way. Um, so that's what, uh, what, what I hope. Thank you. Um, did any of the other participants, Neela, would you like to sort of add anything to that? Yeah, I think that the, the role that headphone verbatim theatre can play, especially when it's made as a collective, um, I think when collectors work together to make a piece like this, to really delve into like an issue that might be a, a current point of tension somewhere um, is really powerful. And I, I hope um, that more kind of theatres take more risk with headphone because it can you can make a show really quickly if there's is there's a local issue that's like um people feel very divided on then you can bring a community together to, to make a piece um very fast and i don't think 
well, maybe many theatres don't know their local communities well enough to, to, to do that and to know what the pieces would be about. Um, but I think you can trust the form because you can go out quickly and get a lot of material from, from somewhere and work together to make a piece that puts the nuances of how complex things are across. And I kind of hope you see more headphone being used um, in kind of rapid response work. Um, to make theatre fast on, on, on difficult topics so that you don't just get binary views on something. Okay, great. That's uh, that, what, what Neela's just said, something there that's made me think about a view that I'd like to get from everyone here, which is about theatre, not just verbatim theatre. Theatre is going through a very difficult time in the pandemic. I was wondering if uh, from, from those, all of you who are involved so deeply with theatre. Is there a message? Is there something you would like to say about that, that you would like people to think about when they're thinking um, about all the different things in, in, in the pandemic? How does the, how has the pandemic changed the world of theatre for you as performers, for you as creative art, you know, contributors, all the different things that you do? And, and even what you said about about um, um, this particular technique of verbatim and working with communities is something that that sort of struck a chord with me in terms of of the changing sort of landscape as we live in the pandemic of of where we are and what we do because uh, theatre has been so associated with with the sort of certain parts of London, shall we say, and, and that are out of bounds at, at certain points now. So just, just throwing that question out there to all of you, just to see what you think. Do, do the actors want to go? Have a yeah, um, so I work for a venue in Manchester. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, I think the landscape of theatre is going to change. I've already seen, um, uh, one of the positives is I've seen artists become so innovative in the way that they're working now. Um, headphone verbatim, I think, uh, you know, when I spoke to Chris, she actually, you know, it was sort of the first time she did a show online and she actually found out that it worked really well online. It's one of the mediums that actually work really well online and offline, um, which on stage. Um, so I've seen so many artists just break, you know, really out of the box. Um, it's been hard in that everyone's had to throw themselves online and all of a sudden theatre makers and, you know, are having to become experts overnight, um, which we're not, you know, we've always been made for live theatre. Um, so artists are creating work that I think you will be able to see going forward. Um, is really exciting, actually, um, and really innovative using the post, using social media, using outside spaces, audio walks, all those kind of things, you know, we're starting to adapt um, to this new uh, phase of theatre to become more, um, you know, equipped for what's coming ahead. Um, and just working with artists, you know, and creating that duality of having a digital aspect as well as a live aspect that are both equally uh, of high quality so that going forward, you know, people can still enjoy theatre, uh, whether whether the pandemic happens, continues or not. Thank you. So from my own perspective, I mean, I feel that as a practitioner, what we are trying to do is to tell our stories. Uh, in my case, let's say the stories about the Asian community in Britain and how we fit in this country in the context of our history, our colonial connectedness and our contemporary lives together. Uh, and in a way, I'm always feeling like I'm working one story at a time. So to a certain degree, um, it's really, really sad there is no live theater in big spaces or small spaces, you know. And it's great that we are all learning how to adapt to new technologies, what it can do for us. I mean, it's really been a learning curve over these last few months for all of us in some way or the other. However, in terms of the the push to try and continue to tell our stories is something that I just think, well, I hope it's gotten easier because of this conversation, which has begun with decolonization of the curriculum, but it's going into Black Lives Matter, now Black History Month on ITV and, you know, that resonance and the teaching of colonial history. So you feel that maybe 
the path might be a little easier to be heard. Mm -hmm. Being an optimist, but hey. Yeah, we definitely need optimism in, in these times. I, I worry I'm, you know, try and be optimistic, but you know, the theatre will is struggling during COVID and the arts in general, and there's a lack of support. You know, the government has said to artists, you know, you need to go and retrain. And I think my fear with that is that, you know, not sounding too, too grim, but authoritarian governments shut down the arts because the arts is where people imagine and reimagine what futures can look like. And if you stop people from having access to that, then you stop them reimagining something of what they want better for themselves. So I think we have to be really careful that the arts don't die um, and that we keep it alive in all the places that we can and not just you know, for, for people who have traditionally been able to afford to go to the big theatres, but art is so crucial to, to communities across this whole country. Um, and I think there's there's a purpose for not allowing it to necessarily get through COVID. That's my personal fear. Um, so I think we have we have to fight to keep the space open for imagination, basically. Yeah, very important point. Absolutely. And um... well, I think people's career, you know, and, and on a very sort of practical level, you know, how people are going to sort of earn a living. <laughs> You know, if, if, if the theatre, you know, theatres are closing, cinemas are closing, what's being made, you know, all of that, you know, those of us who are, who, who rely on this as our core income as well, you know, we can't deny that it's a very difficult time at the moment. Yeah, that's, um, and any, any of the others want to say? Any of the actors want to come in on that? Yeah, um, I also agree with Neela as well. I'm, I'm hoping this doesn't uh, make working class actors, writers, directors leave the industry because um, because they can't afford to support themselves in it, you know. So, um, but in terms of audiences, this uh, a viral world might make it cheaper and more accessible for people to view things as well. So um, there's people doing like companies like Slung Low and Leeds are doing outdoor drive-in theatre. So that's new. So there's there's new stuff happening as well. In terms of a personal level, um, uh, for getting the theatre fix in terms of performance. I've done some online Zoom sh um, performances where there's been a, a green room on, on WhatsApp where we've got our beginners call and our five call and mm -hmm. um, actors have chatted like you would in a green room if you've got 10 minutes before your next scene mm -hmm. and you've still got a buzz for live performance. I have anyway mm -hmm. um, on, on the screen. It's different, but it was the same. I can't describe it, but the same buzz um being on uh, in my living room so uh, so yeah there are there's lots of nice things happening but hopefully um you know we'll survive hopefully we'll survive mm -hmm. okay yeah uh thank you for that there was a question that came in and um i think um from from a region you've answered that she said you've answered it due to covid many working class artists have lost their livelihoods and are confined to private spaces do you think verbatim theatre can fill that gap or reimagine theatres so that we could engage with people meaningfully? And if so, how? And she says, Naveed is answering my question. Uh, so then there's a comment from Annie. Uh, it's allowed us to strip everything back, sans bells and whistles to focus on story and that understanding can be gifted to non-makers, to communities and individuals, making it more accessible that we are all storytellers. That's powerful. So I think there's there's so many things here that I think we could we could continue the discussion for another hour, couldn't we? Because there are uh, the all important issue of the class divide in 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 this country is is a big one, you know, across you know the arts in education. It's across the board, and it is a very serious time for for communities. Absolutely. So I think that the power to the community and the and the consent the sort of how communities rebuild in times of of disaster and in times of crisis like this one is is something hopefully that we will look back on and and think 
and they will help us to think differently to what the state perhaps would like us to think. Um, so, so Neela, I hope, you know, there will be optimism amongst the pessimism. And uh, sadly, I can, I can sort of not say that there will be a lot of um, financial support for that, because that doesn't, like you all said, you know, the film scene is changing the whole kind of the way big companies work, the, the sort of James Bond film not releasing. So certain big companies deciding to do things and, and how the whole system of capital works within the arts also has an impact on people who are just working in small theatres and the arts organisations. So it's, it's a huge, huge um, challenge that's ahead. And, and, you know, hats off to you guys for doing the fantastic work that you do and for giving up your time to be with us here tonight. If we were in a live audience, we would have had a round of applause. So please imagine the round of applause. And, and I think on Zoom, you can actually put clap, hand clapping sort of gestures on, can't you? I'm, I'm not very good at that, I'm a bit rubbish. But thank you, thank you to all of you. And it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, please visit us um, again. And we look forward to the verbatim performance from Butcher Boulevard on Saturday, the 24th of October. I very much hope that you will tune in again for that. And also sign up for our Festival of Ideas events. We also we have lots of stuff happening. There's masterclasses, there's panel discussions. There are thing, all things decolonizing. So tune in and join in and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, everyone. Could I just remind everyone as well that Touchstone Tales is on next Thursday. So it was in the um, you know links. So if you want to watch the, the second half of monologues and duologues around the theme of touch, please sign up for that as well, please. It's next Thursday. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you. for joining. Bye for now. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.